Now, I know that not everybody here is married. How, how many here are married? Could I see the hands of those that are married? Just raise your hands. Those that are married, okay. And uh, uh, some, some, of, some of you couldn't raise your hands, okay. But how many of you who aren't married, you'd like to be married? Let's see those hands. There's a few honest people around. There's a few honest people around. I was telling, I was telling some of you guys, I was telling some of you guys, you know, uh, it's going to take a miracle, okay. But God's in the miracle working business, okay. So there's hope. There's hope. And praise the Lord for that. Uh, we're going to be studying tonight in Colossians chapter 3. If you would turn there, please, Colossians chapter 3. I, I want to share with you that um, uh, some, the truths that we're going to be studying tonight are from the Bible, from God's Word. Amen. And the Word of God, you can count on it. You can count on it. Now, I also want to share with you that uh, uh, some of the illustrations that I'm going to use tonight may sound very similar to you. But if they are, it's entirely by accident. I have to tell you that, okay? Uh, don't you be like uh, uh, one of my preacher friends in the, in, in Los, in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he, 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 he mentioned from the pulpit, and he has a rather large church there, a Spanish-speaking church. Uh, they run about 2,000. And he mentioned from the pulpit, he said, I saw something that was just terrible. He said, I saw a lady that was beating, was, was taking her fist and beating her husband at Walmart. And the Monday morning, his phone rang, and it was a lady, a dear lady in the church, and she said, Pastor, I'm offended with you. He said, why? And she said, well, you should not be talking about me in front of all the other people. And he said, what do you mean? She said, about that hitting my husband in Walmart. And he said, I have to tell you something. He said, I wasn't talking about you. He said... I was talking about someone I don't even know, but are, is it true you really were hitting your husband on Walmart? <laughs> you know, in Spanish we say, ya te quemaste, you know, you've already, you've already burned yourself. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and by the way, the evangelist has three advantages. Number one, I don't know who I'm preaching to. I don't know who's been having good, sweet, wonderful marriage and who's been having fights every day. I don't know. Um, and, and, and so, uh, and by the way, uh, pastor, all he says is good things about you. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know uh, uh, what uh, you must be bringing him a lot of those cocoa. What are those th cocoa things that he likes? Uh, 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 what, what are those things called? Co you know, cocoa curry. You must be bringing him a lot of them because he says good things about you all the time. And uh, as a matter of fact, according to him, this is this is the perfect church. And I don't. I, I'm almost afraid to come preach. I'm afraid I might mess it all up. You know. But uh, I, 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 I have to tell you that because. Uh, I, always when I preach this message, there are some couples that the illustrations are very close to home. I'm going to tell you why that is. God has privileged me to counsel many, many, many couples, okay? And, and, and because uh, I, I've had that experience, uh, I, 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 it's kind of like when you go to the doctor. You know, you go to the doctor and you say, hey, it hurts here and hurts there, and I have this and that and the other. And he's, oh, I know what it is, and he gives you a medicine. How did he know that? because of all the experience he had accumulated knowing, you know, that that's what that is. When a person has this and that and the other, then that, that's what that is. So uh, uh, the advantage, evangelist has three advantages. One is that I don't know who I'm preaching to. Number two, if you don't like what I preach, uh, well, Tuesday I'm back on a plane to the States, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and praise, praise the Lord, my, my, my Teresita, my wife, she still loves me. Amen? Okay? And uh, number three, I have another advantage. Let me tell you what it is. When I preach, you know that I'm preaching for you because I, I, I have nothing to benefit if you obey God. And I don't lose anything if you disobey God. Uh, and so that's one of the advantages of the pastor. I'm here to help you to this evening, okay? And so I ask you to be patient with me uh, as we go forward. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, I have good news for all of the ladies, okay? I am not going to preach from verse 18. I will not be preaching from verse 18. All the ladies said, oh, amen, Brother Garlic. We like you already, Brother Garlic. That's a great preacher right there. He's not going to preach from verse 18. Uh, I, I have a couple things I want to say about that, though. Uh, uh, if, if you don't like what it says there in verse 18, please don't get mad at me. I didn't write it, okay? Somebody a lot smarter than me wrote that verse 18, okay? And by the way, he has your best interest at heart, okay? And, and, and I, I want to also, also say something to you. I really thank God 
for the position of honor and dignity that this book gives to women. And I thank God that we uh, are blessed to have that position of honor and dignity. I, I do not believe in, in the modern uh, feminist concept uh, in all of its facets of seeking equality with men because I believe its presumption is false, is fallacious. I believe that, uh, that saying we're seeking equality with men in terms of equal pay and, and all the rest, I agree with that 100%. But I don't believe that the Bible ever says the woman's inferior to the man. And I don't understand why a woman would want to leave her position of honor and dignity to lower herself to be equal with a man. I don't understand that. Now, I'm not talking about equal pay, and I'm not talking about, of course I believe in that, okay? That's just fair. That's just right. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about praise God for the position of honor and dignity this book uh, uh, pre presents women in. I, I feel sorry for some of the uh, ladies that are in Islamic countries in the Muslim countries. Um, and and I, know, I know many of you already know, did you know that in, in the true, devout Islamic religious countries, uh, they have a police, that their full-time job, they have rubber, rubber uh, rods, their full-time job is to beat women who don't obey what they think is the religious law uh, that should be obeyed. A woman who speaks to a man without him first speaking to her in those countries. They set upon her, and they beat her. And, and they patrol the streets to see if some woman may be revealing a, a lock of her hair. And, and even in the hot countries, they put them in the burqas. And, 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 and I'm describing Afghanistan before, uh, before the war. That's exactly what I'm describing. And, uh, and, 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 and I think, you know, the Muslim men are allowed by religious law to marry seven wives. Okay, and, 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 and before that, they could marry more. And uh, the Muslim man is allowed to divorce his wife, but the, the Muslim woman can never divorce her husband. She cannot do that. And if a Muslim man divorces one of his wives, her family will not give her food to eat. And she is not allowed to go out and look for a job. A woman in, the, in some of these devout Islam, now, now not all the Islamic countries, but in, in the devout uh, a religious Islamic countries. A woman uh, uh, is not allowed to leave to go out alone. She must go with either her dad or her husband or one of her brothers if she's even out alone. And, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just a sad, sad condition that, that, that I thank God for the Bible that places women in their position of honor and dignity. And by the way, uh, um, we have uh, ladies conferences. My wife conducts ladies conferences throughout the Spanish-speaking world. And, I t and the men... Uh, don't 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 they don't like to try to live without without their wife without mama for for even 24 hours uh, and all the kids are 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 como decimos en español echándole porros a mamá they're they're cheering mom on you know they're saying they're saying no don't go don't go don't go because they know how daddy cooks <laughs> and and they don't want mom to go you know and so uh, and so I told the men I said now listen you need to you need to you need to see if, if you can convince your, your wife to, to go because we have a difficult responsibility with her, difficult task with her, almost impossible in these ladies' conferences, almost impossible task. But uh, you pray that God gives us success because it's, it's really, really a, a benefit you if, if God does because the almost impossible task we have with your wife at these conferences is to convince her to put up with you one more year. But we'll try. We'll do our best to do that, you know, if we can, you know. And, and you pray that God gives us success in, the, in that category. And by the way, yeah, I, you remember the creation story. And, and this is exactly where I come from the premise that by no means does God present a woman as inferior to a man. Never, ever, ever. Okay? Uh, uh, God made creation. Everything he made, he said, wow, that's good. Remember that? Everything he made, he said, it was good. And after he made man, he did not say, it was good. What he said was, there's something missing. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. By the way, uh, 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 never in the Bible does it say that a woman is incomplete without a husband. But it does say that a man is incomplete without a wife. That's exactly what it said. And then after God made Eve, then he said, oh, okay, now it's good. <laughs> okay. And, and so, so that's exactly the truth there. 
Um, I'm told that in the in the Hindu religion, religion I've been told they believe in reincarnation. By the way, that's a lie. It's not true. The scripture says it's appointed unto man once to die, and 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 after this the judgment. But uh, I, I, by and by the way, that uh, that false belief has caused many problems. Okay, because they believe that if you're very very good, you'll come back in a better state, and if you're very very bad, then you'll come back in a worse state. And, and, and what I'm told is that the best you could possibly come back at is a cow. As a matter of fact, that's almost nirvana. That's almost enlightenment. You know, the cow is just so content. And, and, and many times we've heard of famines in some of these lands. And, uh, and uh, when I was a little boy, they used to tell me, you know, uh, when I, my mom and some of my aunts would tell me, hey, listen, you better eat your breakfast. Remember, the kids in India, are, are, they're starving. And I felt like sometimes saying, well, let's pack the food up and send it over there to them. You know, because that's, that's, what, that's what's going on. But, you know, they didn't have a real starvation problem in India. They had a, they had a problem of, of believing false beliefs in India. Because while those children were starving, they're taking the food that they should have given, the grain that they should have given to feed the children, they're feeding the cows. And, and what they should have done is killed the cows and had some hamburgers at the same time, you know. I mean, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, is they believe in reincarnation. And they're very careful, though. Uh, 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 they, they, they don't even want to kill a mosquito or a cockroach, uh, uh, you know, because who knows? It could be Aunt So-and-so that just came back. Who knows, you know? We don't know. We, we want to be careful. And uh, I'm told that in certain sects of the, of, the, of the Hindu religion, they believe that the worst you can come back, if you're very, 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 very bad, that you'll come back as a woman. That's what, they, that's what I'm told. <laughs> And, and, and I'm told that this false belief uh, uh, causes the men to be very abusive and, 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 and really mistreat the women because their, 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 their rationale is, well, she had to have been bad in her past life or else she wouldn't be here as a woman. And, and, but I thank God for, for the Bible that puts woman in her place of dignity and honor. I thank God for that. And uh, I, I, also, I also do not believe in unisex. I'm going to tell you why I don't believe in unisex. Because God made us different. And I say, like the French, viva la difference. Long live the difference, okay? Thank God for the difference. Uh, by the way, they just did a multi-million dollar study, and they came to the conclusion that men and women think differently. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a good, good use of money right there. Uh, I, I, I could have saved them the money. We, you know, we could have printed a lot of Las Spotas if we just asked Nathaniel, my seven-year-old, do men and women think differently? And he would have said, yes. Okay, and we'd have got that study out of the way. But they found that, the, that the, even the baby, the, the, the male baby in the crib, already his brain is being bathed with hormones that inhibit the connections between the left side of his brain and the right side of his brain. Uh, basically what they're saying is, is that the man, because with one side we think emotionally, one side we think logically, the man finds it very difficult, if not impossible, to think both emotionally and logically at the same time. Uh, uh, what, 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 and by the way, some of you wives knew your husband was half crazy, and now they've proved it. He can only think with half his brain at the time, you know. Uh, 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 ladies don't have that problem. As a matter of fact, there are literally millions of connections, in, in, in physically, uh, biologically, billions of connections between the left side of their brain and the right side of their brain. And... Uh, and, and for a lady, it's almost impossible that she think with one or the other. She's thinking with both all the time. As a matter of fact, one young man called me up. He was a newlywed. He said, Brother Garlic. He said, what do I do? I said, what's the problem? He said, my wife is crying. And I said, why is she crying? And he said, she doesn't know. <laughs> I said, well, I long live the difference. And, and sometimes what we want to do is I find, I find couples that want to change their spouse to be more like they are. Because this, these differences that we're talking about, uh, 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 they're very real and they're good. It's not that one is better than the other. It's God made us different and we complement each other. Okay? I'll give you an example. Because of the way a man thinks, if we were a newspaper, uh, the man would be the title the title. I'll give you an example. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. You ask your husband, how did it go? And he's going to answer, good. It went well. That's the title. 
There's the title. There's the announcement. I know ladies that are frustrated because they wanted more detail. You know, come on. You know, get, get, tell me more. So they'll say to their husband, well, what did you do? And he'll look back at her and he'll say, I worked. <laughs> uh, by the way, on the other side of the coin, if we were newspapers, the wife, the lady would be the article. Because you ask the lady, how did it go? And she'll say, well, this morning when I woke up, and she'll give all the details of the day, all the details of the day. And I know some men that get frustrated because they're looking for the title in the article. And their wife is, and, and they'll say, well, get to the point, honey. What, what's the point? You know, where, where, where's the title? I, and, and I say, I allow your spouse to be who God made them to be. I, 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 we need, I, what would the newspaper be if we had no titles? And what would the newspaper be if we didn't have the article? You see, we need each other, and that's good for us. Uh, there's many, many other differences. I don't have time to go into all of them, but I, I just want to illustrate this uh, uh, with one more illustration real quick. Uh, the man is, is, uh, has a, has a God-given desire to uh, contribute something, to be something, to conquer, to, uh, to, to, to finish uh, what he starts. If, if we were to say among us, us fellas, okay, we're going to go to the mall and buy a tie, okay? Uh, we would get together and we would make a plan, uh, okay? Where's the best place around here? And your coax, uh, there I go again. And your coaxka, your coaxka, your coaxka. I want to get that right before I leave here. You guys be patient with me, your coaxka. Where's the best place in your coaxka to buy a tie? And there would be different ideas and different suggestions, and we'd settle on one, and we'd go, okay? If we went in a car, we would park as close as we possibly could to the where they sell the ties, because that's the man thing. That's the way the man do, does the thing, okay? And we would get out. Uh, uh, this is we would get out of the car and we'd walk straight to the ties. We would not. Ha we would not be interested in looking at the shoes. <laughs> it would not interest us to go look at the shoes. We'd go to the ties and and and, and we'd pick out a tie and. And we might uh, look for the best price and the color, and, 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 and after we settled on the tie, we'd buy the tie and go home because we finished. We did what we came to do. Now, the, the, the ladies, on the other hand, well, every lady knows that if you're going to buy shoes, there's nothing long, wrong with looking at blouses and skirts and, 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 and uh, 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 pocketbooks and purses and and there's nothing wrong with, with taking advantage of the trip. Some of you ladies may have wondered why when it's vacation time. It's time for vacation, right? And your husband is up at four in the morning ready to go. You're just going, you know, three hours down the road to see grandma. That's all you're doing. But what he's going to do is he's going to have everybody in the car at four because he wants to get there. And there you are going down the road, and one of the, one of the children in the back says, I need to go to the bathroom. And Dad says, well, hold it. You know, we're headed on down the road. That's, that's the man thing. And by the way, long live the difference. We need somebody that's driving to finish the journey. And we need somebody else to remind us to enjoy the flowers while we're driving and to uh, enjoy the sunset while we're driving. We, you see, long live the difference. And so don't try to change and make your wife to be more masculine. And don't try to make your husband be more feminine. Let your spouse be who God made them to be, okay? Uh, now, uh, verse 18 is there, and I got good news for the men as well, because I'm not going to preach on the first part of verse 19. But I have to also say to you fellas that just because I'm not going to preach on it doesn't mean it's not there. Now, I also want I, I, I do have to clarify one thing on, on, on the first part of verse 18. 19, I have to clarify that second word of the verse because the culture, the society in which we live has so distorted that word that sometimes there's some confusion as to what that word means. Uh, we have a saying in English that uh, doesn't translate well to other, other languages. And I, and I think it's probably even uh, an erroneous presentation in English. And it has to do with love. How many have heard the phrase, I fell in love? Almost as if it were an accident. You know, I was walking down the sidewalk one day, and I stumbled, and I fell, and it resulted I'm in love. That's what happened. You know? 
And one fellow came into my office and he said, Brother Garlic, I've discovered the problem in my marriage. What's the problem in, my, in your marriage? I have fallen out of love. <laughs> <laughs> to him, love is something you fall into or fall out of, you know? It's just something he has no control of. We have this picture of Cupid up there with bow and arrow, you know, and all of a sudden we're walking down the side and boom, oh, 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 you know, there it is, you know. And we think love is an emotion, this emotional feeling, this, uh, this romantic, uh, you know, the butterflies in the stomach. We think that's what love is. Hollywood adds to that, uh, that, that presentation, okay? But I am here to announce to you that love is not an emotion. Love is a decision. And it's the decision to complete and fulfill the needs of the person that's loved whatever it takes, whatever it costs, whatever it requires. And what God is saying in the verse here, he's saying, husbands, I want you to decide that you're going to meet the needs of your wife, period. That's what it's saying here. By the way, we're going to get into what the emotion is. But the agape love that we're talking about, this agape love we're talking about, the godly love, is the decision to meet the needs of the needs of love object. I want to show you real quickly with a couple verses you know. Remember John 3, 16? You could read that verse this way. For God so decided that he would meet the needs of this world that he gave his only begotten son. Or you could take Romans 5, 8 and say, but God commendeth uh, 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 his decision. He shows his decision to us to meet our needs and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love God has. God decided that he was going to meet our needs. And, and as, the, as the testimonies have so eloquently said every night, here we were on our way to hell, and God reached out to us and saved us. That's wonderful. And so I want to clarify that word there because that word has nothing to do about emotions. You and I don't control our emotions. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, everybody, please get angry with me right now. <laughs> you can't do it. I, I mean, so I, 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 I suppose I could provoke some anger. Maybe if I preach too long, I'll have some people angry with me. Never know, okay? But, uh, but the truth of the matter is, God is not going to tell you to do something you can't do. You can't control whether you have butterflies in your stomach every time you see your wife, whether you have that romantic, emotional feeling every time you see your wife. But you can control whether you've decided that you're going to meet her needs. You can, you can control that. And that's what God's saying here. But the good news is I'm not going to preach from that verse first part because what I'm going to preach uh, from is verse 19, the second part. Now, it's interesting that in verse 18, God says to the wife, this is what I want you to do. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, which is a parallel passage, uh, uh, describes the wife's responsibilities to the husband as that of respecting him. You can't know how much your husband wants to be respected. You can't know that because, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, dear wife, you don't have the same needs that your husband has. And by the way, husband, you don't have the same needs that your wife has. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with a wife loving her husband. The Bible uh, encourages it. As a matter of fact, it says, let the elder women, and by the way, they don't exist. They don't exist. I have asked in many of the churches where I've preached, how many elder women are here present? And nobody has raised their hand. Nobody. But if such a woman existed, an elder woman, an elderly woman, if such a person existed, uh, she is supposed to teach the younger women how to love their husband. Nothing wrong with a wife loving her husband. There is nothing wrong with a husband respecting his wife. In our culture, many of the things we do out of etiquette are showing respect to our wife when we pull a chair uh, for her or when we open a door for her. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to understand that Ephesians 5 is clearly presenting the basic need of the husband as that of receiving respect and the basic need of the wife as receiving love. And so, wife, you can't understand how it hurts the heart of your husband when you lack respect until you understand that it hurts his heart when you are lacking in respect to him just as much as it hurts your heart when he's lacking in love for you. Because you know how it feels when words come out of his mouth that aren't loving or when decisions he makes are not loving, are not committed to meeting your needs, are not thinking about you and putting you first in the place that every husband should place his wife. You know how that hurts. And God forbid that any man should raise his hand against his wife and, and, and unlovingly 
use his, his hand or his body. God forbid. But you know how that hurts you emotionally when that happens, if that were to happen. Okay? And you have to understand, wife, that that's exactly how it hurts your husband when out of your mouth come words that are not respectful. And that's exactly how it hurts your husband when out, of your, when out of your life come decisions and attitudes that are not respectful. And I, I, I'm not comparing the physical abuse. I'm not comparing that at all. I'm not, trying to, I'm not talking the physical realm. But on an emotional realm, the pain is the same. On an emotional realm, the pain for the, the wife when she is not loved or when unloving actions or attitudes or decisions are made, the pain she feels when she is not loved, that's the same pain your husband feels when he is not respected. We have to understand that. And I'm not putting the two on par because physically there's a world of difference. And God forbid that any man should do that. But the fact of the matter is, is that verse 19 says two things to the husband. To the wife it says, do this. To the husband it says, do this. And then it adds something. It says, don't do that. It says, be not bitter against them. And I begin to ask myself, why did God to the husband add a phrase, be not bitter against them? And that word bitter is not just the word that, uh, that, uh, that uh, I got upset. The root of that word in, 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 in the original text has deep, deep history. It's not something that happened one day to the other. It's a decision that the husband made. And I begin to ask myself, why is that there? Why to the wife didn't he, why did he not tell the wife what he didn't want her to do? Why did he just tell her what he does want her to do? To the husband, he says, this is what I do want you to do. I want you to love her. And then he also adds, and I don't want you to be bitter. And I begin to understand that it is impossible for a man to obey the first part of verse 19 without having difficulties or struggles with the second part of verse 19. Now, I'm going to explain to, you, to the wives here, I want you to understand, wife, why it is your husband battles with this. And please don't think your husband's the only one battling with this. We talked about the Baptist face, those of you who are here in the other services. You know, sometimes we come to the church with a Baptist face and we think, oh, wow, you know, all the other husbands, they're not having these problems. Don't you believe it, ma'am. Okay, don't you believe it. All you see is, you see me here, don't you be like the man that came into my office and said, Brother Garlic, you know, if I could, if my wife could just be like Sister So-and-So, he named another sister in the church. But uh, what he didn't know is that Sister So-and-So had come in the week before for some counseling, and he had no idea. Oh, was she ever a mess. <laughs> but all he saw was on Sunday morning she'd come in and she looked so spiritual, she looked so wonderful. He said, well, if my wife could just be like her, his wife was a thousand times better than her, okay? But he didn't have a clue. And I think sometimes that can also apply to wives. You know, they look and they say, wow, you know, look at that husband. He doesn't look like he's ever bitter against his wife. I want to tell you something. There is not a man alive who fulfills the first part of verse 19 that doesn't have to struggle with the second part of verse 19. Not a man alive. The truth of the matter is there's a reason God put it in the Bible. There's a reason God put it there. He said, be not bitter against them. And the reason for that is because when you truly love someone, then you make yourself vulnerable to that person. A mother told the servant of the Lord, I've decided I'm not going to let my children break my heart anymore. The servant of the Lord responded and said, I'm disappointed to hear that. She said, why? He said, because what you're telling me, mother, mommy, is that you've decided you're not going to love your children anymore. Do you understand that if you really love your child, that they are going to be able to hurt you if they do wrong or if they make decisions that hurt them? It's going to hurt because you do love them. When you love someone, you become vulnerable to that person. I'll give you a, an illustration. I was driving down the road in South Texas and uh, on expressway, I don't remember changing lanes. I was not going fast or slow. A, 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 a lady came up b beside me, and she was, she was angry. I could tell. Because you ladies know that a lady can have the face of a wonderful princess, a queen, but she can also have the face of a witch. You know what I'm talking about. She can. 
And I looked over there, and this lady was exceedingly angry. I don't know what I did. I think it must have been some other blonde guy, because you know all the blonde guys look alike, okay? But I, I, it must have been somebody else that offended her. But, but, but she was offended. I know because she was uh, waving at me with a particular finger. What could I do? I said, I'm sorry. That's all I could do. I don't know what I did. I'm sorry. And, and she said, well, you know, I, I'm glad you learned your lesson and, 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 and some other things. I couldn't hear her words, but that was the gist of what she was saying, and she went her way angrily. And that night, I must confess, I did not lose any sleep. <laughs> didn't affect me. I wasn't vulnerable to her. I didn't know her. I certainly didn't love her. <laughs> On the other side of the coin, if this dear lady here is upset with me just a little bit, oh, it hurts. Because the love I feel for her makes me vulnerable to her. Now, ladies, I'm going to tell you something here that is not going to come as a surprise to you. Okay? You already know it. I know you know it. You know you know it. I don't know if your husband knows you know it. And so it's okay to pretend to be surprised even though you're really not. Okay? I'm giving you permission to do that. I'm joking now, okay? So please, please, please understand that. Are you ready for the news? You ready for, to be surprised? Sometimes the man, get ready for your surprise face, ladies, can be very selfish. <gasps> you don't say... No, Brother Garlic, no. No, not my husband. No, never, never, never. No, no. sometimes the man can be very selfish. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the man, uh, uh, God said he wants, uh, he wants the man to love his wife like Christ loved the church. I had one fellow tell me, oh, I can't do that, Brother Garlic. No, I'm not God. I'm not Christ. I'm just a man. I can't love her that much. And I said, oh, yes, you can. Well, how do you know, Brother Garlic? because I already know somebody you love that much. Who? I said, you. <laughs> See, the passage goes on to say, uh, so for somebody who can't understand, said, love her like you love yourself, because it's the same kind of love. A man is determined. He's already decided he's going to meet his need. He's already decided that. I, I, I deal with all third world countries, and it's amazing how, time, how many times the man will hide behind poverty. His wife will... Well, we'll say she needs a new pair of shoes or needs a new dress. And he'll say, well, you know, it's tight, but we'll just wait. Uh, maybe next month we'll have enough money in the budget, okay? But let him get a desire for something, you know. Let him get a desire to pick up, you know, a little new toy or something else. Oh, you know, I found the way. If we adjust here and fix over here, you know, we can do it, okay? Uh, 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 a man will move heaven and earth to avoid pain. He will. Matter of fact, one fellow said, it's a good thing God didn't make the men have the babies because if he did, every family would have at the most one and probably zero because he'd talk to his buddies and decide he wasn't interested. <laughs> yeah, that's true. A man, a man will move heaven and earth to avoid pain. And that's what causes a man to get bitter against his wife. Love can turn to bitterness like that. Because he's vulnerable to her, and most men don't have the maturity, the spiritual maturity, to obey. And, and men, I'm explaining to your wife why this happened, but I hope no one leaves here tonight thinking that I'm giving you an excuse to do it because it's sin. What the man will do then is kind of like the turtle. You know, there's no enemies out there. He's trotting around, but he sees danger, and he goes into that shell. It's almost like he... He has a, a castle, and, 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 and he keeps a watch. And when he sees the enemy approaching, before the arrows strike, he's pulled up the drawbridge, buttoned down all the hatches, and he's inside, and he's untouchable. Some of you ladies have wondered why it is that you live in the same house, you eat at the same table, and you even sleep in the same bed, but you never talk. I mean, you never really talk. Well, I'm telling you why it is. It's this problem right here. What's happened is the man has grown bitter. And that word bitter means he's cut himself off 
from. He's gone into a shell from. In the United States, I find a lot of, of men, because if you don't hear anything I say, please listen to this. The river can be directed, but it cannot be stopped. There are needs in the heart of the man, there are needs in the heart of the woman that can be directed, but it cannot be stopped. Most women, when the man stops loving, go to seek love from their family. They go to mama. They go to their sister, or they go to a dear friend, a good friend. And they'll say, you'll listen. My husband's not listening, but you'll listen. Most men, when they're not getting respect at home, will seek it in their career and what they're doing because there is something that a man can feel when he has built something or done something and he'll say, you know, there, I have contributed, I have, I have made something, okay? And there's some, there's some uh, uh, I was talking to some, a Spanish group here recently, I said, some of you ladies may be wondering why your husband is working uh, full-time, part-time, and all the time, <laughs> okay? <laughs> He's just out there, okay? And, 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 and I know that in the military, we deal with the real situation. And, and by the way, how I thank you, every one of you who are in the military, and how I thank your, fam you, you, your families, your military families, for, for the sacrifices you make so that, so that we can be free. I, I, I cannot express the gratitude I feel in my heart and I know that I speak for many of, uh, 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 of, of, of our fellow Americans as I, as, I, as I seek to express that gratitude. I know the sacrifice it is, when, especially in the, in, in the Navy, when, when sometimes the ships are out and, 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 and Mama's having to, to wear both hats and so on, and, and I thank you for that. Okay. But the truth of the matter is, is that the man withdraws from his wife because he doesn't want to be hurt anymore. And that's why I'm going to make this statement. I hope you're listening. A wife should never criticize her husband, neither in public nor in private. Now, I know why you do it. The reason that you criticize him, especially in private, is because you know he needs to change and you want to help him change. I want you to consider this. Since Adam and Eve, the first marriage, up until now, do you know how many men have been changed for the better by the criticism of their wife? The answer is none. The only thing that's happened through the criticism of the wife, and I'm not talking about the constructive help that a wife can give. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about the criticism. She's tempted her husband to withdraw from her. And much less in public. You know, I understand why, uh, why you would go to your mom when your husband has not been listening to you. I told your husband just a few minutes ago, if he's present, that the river has to be directed, but it cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. Sooner or later, it's going to try to break out. And you have a need to talk, to share, to, to in Spanish we say, desahogarse. You who speak Spanish know what I'm saying. You have a need to express yourself. And if, if, if your husband has withdrawn from you, and, and even when he's home, you can't talk, there's a tendency to want to pick up the phone and call mom. Don't do it. There's lots of, th lots of damage that's done when you do it. The next time you go to the family reunion, you know, your mom may not say it, but your husband feels it. He senses it. Your mom's saying, I know you, you old buzzard. In Spanish, we say buitre. Okay. <laughs> you who speak Spanish know what I'm talking about. Okay. I know you. You pretend like you're a good fella. I know you, you know, but your, your, my daughter's been talking to me. And she doesn't say that out loud, but he senses it in his spirit. And the next thing you know, when it's time for your family reunion, your husband's awful busy. You know, I, I, you go, you take the kids, you go. 
And you're saying, what happened? Yeah, what happened is the, is, is the well got poisoned. And I have seen it so many times that a couple's having a fight or having an argument, and, and they go and tell their parents, and the next thing you know, the next thing you know, they're back on their honeymoon. They've already got it all fixed. And yet there's their mom waiting for them. Ha, <laughs> ha, I know you. I'm saying that a wife should not criticize her husband in public or in private. By the way, uh, I have something that may come as news for you, but you're not going to be able to change your spouse. I want to tell you who can change your spouse. Somebody much bigger than you can change your spouse, but you can't change your spouse. I had a young lady told me, said, I I'm thinking about marrying so-and-so. What do you think? And I said, well, have you seen how he treats his mom? Because one of the ways you can tell how a fellow is going to treat his wife is see how that fellow treats his mom. Okay? And by the way, it works the other way around. If you see how a, how a young lady is treating her dad, you can kind of figure out how she's going to respond to her husband. It's not always true, but it's a good rule of thumb. And, uh, and I said, and by the way, do you know that he has this, we say in Spanish, vicio. In English, we say vice. I don't know if the word translates the same. He had a problem with alcohol. That's what he had. And I said, um, do you know about these things? And she said, oh, yes, but I'm going to change him. <laughs> In Spanish, we say, buena suerte, good luck. <laughs> you know what? I have found out that lack of respect produces lack of love and or lack of love produces lack of respect. Oftentimes, we justify our sin because our spouse has not been fulfilling their God-given role either. I call it the circle of destruction. I'm giving you a composite of a real-life illustration. A man was there, and his wife said, I'm going to make mole poblano. Anybody know what mole poblano is? There you go. That's the good stuff. That is a very difficult to prepare dish for Mexico. As a matter of fact, it involves hours of standing over a hot stove, okay, if you're going to prepare it from scratch. And it is delicious. It is just incredibly delicious. And so uh, he went to work, and, and at work uh, he forgot about his dear wife that was there working, and he was not loving. The boss came up and said, hey, could you stay late because we've got this order, and and I need you, and he said, yes, I'll do it, and he was not loving. He didn't call his wife and let her know, didn't do even the courtesy of doing that, and when he got home at 9 o'clock, his lack of love produced lack of respect. She was waiting for him at the door. Where have you been? <laughs> he said something to the effect of, well, oh, Brother Garlic should have preached from Colossians 3.18. <laughs> oh, that was like throwing gasoline on the fire. <laughs> he said, in essence, uh, I want you to know that I'm the man of this house, and I'll come when I want. Uh-oh. <laughs> this is certainly not going to help the situation. And uh, he says, besides, what does it matter? And she says, well, the moly that I've slaved over all day is now cold. And he said, well, heat it back up. And she said, no, you're going to have to heat it if it's going to get hot. <laughs> okay. And so the next thing you know, he's decided to go down to the corner, corner store and buy some tacos. And so she calls mom. The conversation went about like this. Mom, yes, you're not going to believe what's happened now. What's happened now? What has he done to you now? Well... You know, I was making mole today. Oh, Grandma's recipe. Yeah, the good stuff. Oh, well, I bet he came home early for that. No, he didn't come home till 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock? Did you tell him you were making the mole? I sure did. And he didn't come home till 9 o'clock? That's the conversation with Mom. In the meantime, he's down eating tacos with his friend who happened to work late with him. Ah, uh, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> and there, you know how the men are. He says, well, in my house, I'm the head of the home. What he really meant is mama's the neck and she turns me wherever she wants, you know. <laughs> uh, there's a joke in Spanish. I, 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 won't, even, I won't even tell it because it doesn't translate. It wouldn't be fair to everybody that doesn't speak Spanish. But if after the service, if you're interested and you speak Spanish, I'll tell it. Uh, but 
uh, uh, they're sitting there at the, uh, at, at, and, and you know what? Lack of love produces lack of respect. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is to obey God. Amen. See, we want to add to the Bible. It says, husbands love your wives, and the husband wants to add something there that says, if she's respecting you and she deserves it. But the Bible doesn't say that. Right. Have you ever figured out that in your marriage the only person you control is you? And the only person you're responsible for is you? The man says, I know I'm not loving her like I'm supposed to, but she's not respecting me either. Ha ha. Or even. So you know what happens when one of them starts obeying? It gets worse. Because it makes the spouse uncomfortable. You start respecting even if he doesn't love. And even if he doesn't deserve it. But you start respecting because God is... God and God said to do it and God deserves you to obey me. And he gets uncomfortable because now he says I'm not loving and, and now she's respecting. Now the balance is upset. Do you understand? And he knows where all the buttons are. <laughs> so he'll start pushing them. <laughs> He's trying to provoke a lack of respect so he can get the thing back in balance and there he goes. But do you know what happens? If you just keep on obeying, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's a precious promise. Verse 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the, by the what? That word conversation means the life the way of life of the wife. Do you know what happens? There's not a hard heart out there that can stand up to the pressure God can bring. Not a single one. That's exactly what happens. It should be that at the end of the day we say, oh, it's been a tough day today. But now I get to go home and recharge my batteries. And many times the opposite is true. We get done with the day's work and we say, oh, it's been a tough day today. And now I have to go home. <laughs> because the love we feel at home makes us vulnerable to our spouse. We talked about the problem. How about we talk about the solution? Would you like to hear that before we close? I think that'd be good. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. This was written to a church. Actually, it was written to the, uh, the pastor of a church. The word angel there is the word messenger, okay? It's not referring to an angel like the archangel Gabriel. It says, unto the angel, to, unto the messenger of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And ha thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, hast not fainted, Hey, up to now, it sounds like a pretty good church, doesn't it? Sounds like the kind of church I'd like to be a member of. Has some good qualities, doesn't it? By the way, I have news for you. Your spouse has some good qualities. You say, how do you know, Brother Garlic? You don't even know him. You don't even know him. You don't even know her. Oh, yeah, but I've convinced you that at least at, least at one time they had some good qualities. Well, how are you going to do that, Brother Garlic? Well, somehow they convinced you to marry him. <laughs> Has to be something good there. Okay, it has to be something good, yeah. Uh, look at verse uh, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You know what the problem is when we've gotten bitter against our wives, men? We've left our first love. Now you say, what does this passage have to do with marriage? Oh, everything. What is the example that God gave 
of marriage. Isn't it the relationship between the church and Christ? So if we can study what Christ said so that the church could restore their first love to Him, wouldn't it stand a reason that that would be what we could do to restore first love in our marriage? Do you remember the first love? Do you remember when we, we bought that car and, 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 and we, didn't, we didn't need the whole seat? All we needed was those, uh, you know, 23, 28 centimeters right next to the Right next to the steering wheel. See, we were skinnier back in those days, you know. Right there next. You, remember, you know what I'm talking about. You remember. Uh, you remember when somebody pulled up behind us and look, and they'd look at the shadows at night, and they'd say, are there two people in the car or one? You know, they couldn't tell. There we were, just like this. And what's happened? Now uh, people see us driving down the street. We've both got the windows down. Our heads stuck out everybody their side. What's happened? We've lost the first love. How to restore that first love. I was driving from uh, North Carolina, uh, a young man who just started a church. He was called to preach in the conference we have there with Salvador Ramos, and he went to the Bible Institute, and he started. He asked me to come up and preach his, his first anniversary. So I went up there and preached with him. Then I was driving down to Johnny Franco's in Greenville, uh, uh, South Carolina. He's from Ecuador. He has a great church there in Greenville. And as I was driving down, I looked in the, in the mirror, and here was a pickup truck getting ready to pass me. And there was a couple that had not lost their first love. He had his arm around her like this, and they were over there. I mean, had a big old seat in the pickup truck. They were only using that one little, little corner over there by their steering wheel, you know. And, uh, and, and I looked in the mirror, and just as they were passing me, she put her head like this on his shoulder. And you should have seen him. He was like Tarzan, you know. He, he was king, king of the road. He was coming out. You, you remember those days? You remember those days? And what happened? Let's look at what God says about how to restore the first love. Look at verse 5. First step. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. First thing you need to do is remember where you've fallen from. A good idea when you're counseling couples is to ask them to bring the pictures of their life to the counseling session. It's a great idea. You get in there in that pictures and you're taking the first step toward, toward restoring love. Because they begin, to, they begin to look at it. And they remember. Oh, yeah, you remember? Hey, do you remember what it was like? Do you remember what it was like the first time you went over to, to meet your, 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 your girl's parents? And, uh, you know, chicka, 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 chicka. Yeah, you, remember, you remember those days, yeah. Uh, do you remember what it's like, you know, when, when, when you were up there and, and you, you would not appear until every hair was in place? I mean, perfect place. Do you remember those days? You know, and your sister is making fun of you. I think you're in love. I think you're in love. Shut up, shut up. And there you are. Just getting everything. You remember those days? You remember those days? Huh? You remember what it was like when your husband composed that song for you? I know he sings like a burrow. You know, he's out there. But do you remember? Do you remember? You're like, oh, that's so wonderful. Oh, that's so special. You couldn't wait to tell your friends, whoa, you made a song for me. It was the most beautiful thing. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. Or do you remember when he, he tried to be a poet, poet and a long fellow he is not? You know, a Shakespeare he is not. But he, he do you remember that? Do you remember when he... When he brought you the flowers, do you remember those days? Uh, you knew they were from the cemetery, but you weren't going to tell him, you know. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm talking about. You, you remember those days? You remember those days when you were off with your buddies, you know, and you were just thinking about her, and you bought her a little something, brought it back. Do you remember those days? Well, that's the first step toward restoring first love. To remember those days. There's a second step. Look at verse 5. It says, remember therefore from whence thou art falling, and the second step is repent. Amen. Let me tell you something. Fellas, I've spent a lot of time explaining so your wife understands why it is that you withdraw from her. I wanted to explain that. But I hope you understand that it's sin. And it needs to be repented of. If your marriage has fallen into a state where you've lost that first love, the second step is repenting. Now, I have good news. Uh, we go to God, He'll forgive you. It may take a little longer with your spouse. That's okay. 
One of you fellows may show up with flowers for the first time in years, and she may say, okay, what have you done now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, what's going on? Something's happened, you know. <laughs> yeah. Repent. You want to know the honest truth? I believe there's probably many of us in this room that tonight we need to get some things right. And that word repentance is so sweet. Second step to restoring first love. And the third step, look at what it says, verse 5. Remember where you've fallen from, repent. And then the third step, do the first weeks. Hey, fellas, I do not know how, do the first works, excuse me. Yeah, listen, this, this, sometimes I get my tang all tangled up, but you know, I just have to be patient. Do the first works. I, I, I know, I know, fellas, that somehow you convinced her to marry you. At one time you did, you convinced her. I don't know how you did it. In the case of many of you, like I say, it was a miracle, okay? But <laughs> convince her again. How did I do that, Brother Garlic? Same way you convinced her the first time. Do the first work. We're, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're putting some of these, these concepts into a seminar. It's a three-day seminar to help families. We deal with child rearing. We deal with a lot of things. Uh, it's part of the Teach Everything program that, that the Lord's helping, helping us develop with La Spada. But one of the things we're going to do, we're going to put a little video, a series of videos in there. They're going to be do's and don'ts of marriage. We're going to say, this is the way not to say goodbye to your husband in the morning. The way to not say goodbye to your husband in the mor morning. And he's going to be hurrying out the door, you know, going, going off to whatever, whatever he's, he's going to do. And she's going to come out. She's going to have that green mask on. You know, that they, they say it's for beauty, but it makes them look like a Martian. You know what I'm talking about? She's going to have that green mask on. Her hair is going to look like, you know, uh, lightning has struck. <laughs> okay. She's going to be in a very modest uh, 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 house gown. And, and the last word, she, instead of I love you, instead of a kiss, instead of anything, she's going to say, don't forget to bring the milk, you know, <laughs> or something like that. The way he's not to do it. Do you, you, you remember, I'm talking to the wives now, do you remember how it was when you were first in love? Well, go back and do what you used to do. Just go back and do what you used to do. Just go back and do what you used to do. Do the first work. Now, I want to say something here as we close. Love is not an emotion. Love is a decision. But that decision produces actions. And here's the good part. It's the actions that produce the emotions. I promise you, you can have the butterflies back. Decide. Act on the basis of that decision and one day you say, wow, Brother Garlic was right. Bible works. All we need to do is just obey. Just obey. Instead of focusing on what you want your spouse to do or be, be what God wants you to be. And sit back and let God change your spouse. Because He can. And He will. Let's pray. Father, I've preached what you laid on my heart. Now you're going to have to apply it to our lives. Nobody's looking. It's time of invitation. And the time of invitation is where we try to make application and ask you to make a decision based on what you've heard. I want to talk just a minute, Lee, before the piano starts. We'll start in just a minute, okay? How many here tonight would say, Brother Garlic, God has spoken to me tonight. I want you to pray with me that God would help me be everything I need to be in my marriage. If you could say that, would you raise your hand up high? All over, all over, all over. God bless. God bless. Many, 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 many hands. <coughs> Wonderful night of victory. Wonderful night of victory. What a blessing.
I think it'd be good. If we just took some time tonight to kneel right there in our chairs. Pray for our marriages. Lee's going to play the music here in just a minute. And when he does, I invite those of you who God has spoken to, just to just turn around right there in your chair. Just kneel down with your husband or your wife if they're present. If they're not present, you just kneel down and just talk to God. Ask God to help you be everything God wants you to be. Go ahead, Lee. Play a hymn of invitation there. We'll spend some time praying. Go ahead. God's talked to you. Don't hesitate. Just kneel down right there in your chair. I'm sure there's some talking that many of us need to do after we get home. Do you remember how it used to be? Do you remember how it used to be? Are you willing to humbly repent of whatever, whatever part you've had in losing how it used to be? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go back and do what you used to do? Do the first works? Are you willing? I hope so. Maybe some of you say, you know, Brother Garlic, I'm not married, but Tonight I heard things that I want to put in practice when I do get married. God's spoken to me too. If God's spoken to you too, just go ahead and kneel there at your chair. Some of the singles, I know God's spoken to you. God bless you. Amen. Amen.